scientists really are interested to know how fast does water move from one reservoir to another? What kinds of processes cause changes in how fast water moves from one place to the other? And how do the sizes of reservoirs change? Of course, we'd be very concerned about changes in the size of the groundwater reservoir. If the groundwater reservoir is shrinking or disappears, there goes our source of drinking water. In fact, one of the major concerns in climate change is a reduction in ice and snow and glaciers, particularly in many third world countries that depend on those snow and ice and glaciers for their water supply. Shrinking glaciers mean less water for people. And when people don't have water, they have to move. And to move requires quite a bit of um, energy and food in and of itself. And there's even a thought that the absence of water could create water wars on our planet. So it's an important consideration how do the sizes of reservoirs change over time, especially reservoirs that are of interest to humans. So what are the effects of these changes on human water supply, agriculture, biodiversity, ecosystem function, geologic processes, and climate? Who knew that the hydrologic cycle was so important? Okay, so if we just look at an example of rate processes and the relative rates at which water moves about these numbers in parentheses in your book tell you that most of water on our planet is evaporated over the oceans. Most of the water that we find or most of the water that rains on us or most of the water that falls on the continents originated in the oceans. So even if you've never been to the ocean, if it's raining on you, it's really raining ocean water on you. Okay? This also tells us that most of that evaporation in the ocean returns as rainfall back over the ocean. So the ocean really has its own little hydrologic cycle. And some of it, these are units of 10 to the 15th kilograms per year, some of it transported by winds where it precipitates and runs out into the ocean. So this is just a brief example. Uh, not going to go into a lot of details about this, but just so you under, have some understanding that scientists are interested in how these rates change. So we need to identify the rates and how will these rates change in a warming planet. So here we are with the entire figure put together and it hopefully was a little bit easier for you to understand as we took it apart. But in your mind, as you study these figures and look at them, Trace the arrows. Take a look at the sizes of the reservoirs. Take a look back through the slides and learn the story of the hydrologic cycle, particularly as it applies to things that we're going to be talking about during the semester, and particularly as it might apply to your life, your availability of drinking water, and the kinds of things that are happening as our Earth warms up. Okay. In this next section, I'd like to look at some of the sedimentary processes that occur as sediments move from their original location, what we call their parent rock, into the ocean. So we'll look at weathering, the dissolution and fragmentation of rocks, transport, the movement of sediments by winds and water, sinking, the gravity-driven settling of suspended sediments to the seafloor, so the process by which sediments sink down to the seafloor, biological activity, and we already know that biological activity plays a role in sedimentation, and deposition, the coming to rest of sediments on the seafloor. So obviously, since we're taking time to define these words, you'll want to be familiar with them. The dissolution, fracturing, and chemical alteration of rocks is called weathering. And you may have noticed weathering if you go up into the mountains and kind of rub your hands on rocks or kind of just have rock crumble in your hands. If you're a rock climber, you're certainly uh, familiar with the process of weathering of rocks. As it rains on rocks, it begins to dissolve them apart, or it begins to dissolve certain elements, and the rock begins to crumble apart. That weathering process is one of the major processes by which we uh, um, create sediments on our planet. The weathering of a particular rock will depend on its chemical composition, the kind of climate, so if there's a lot of rain, whether there's soil and plants uh, present, 
and how long that rock might be exposed at the surface. But as we see, weathering may be caused by a number of processes, both physical, chemical, and biological. This is a rock that's weathering a piece of granite up in our mountains. We also divide weathering according to how it might be uh, weathered. So we have physical and mechanical weathering. Those are the processes that really just break apart rocks physically. So you running into a rock or hitting a rock with a hammer or a rock slide or an earthquake or the expansion of ice in the cracks. You know that ice expands as it freezes. So when it rains on rocks and then the, that rainwater freezes, it bursts apart rocks. We call that mechanical weathering. Okay? Here's an experiment. Try to put a rock in the freezer at night and in the sun during the day and keep track of its weight. Now this is an experiment that might take a little bit of time, but if you do that for a month, what you'll eventually find is that the rock begins to weather. So just the act of freezing and cooling, and if you think about rocks out in the desert that undergo extreme heating and extreme cooling, you get some idea of how rocks might be physically broken down by just Mother Nature. Here's an example of rain uh, or snow um, on rocks, and it's that ice expansion that breaks rocks apart and creates a type of physical weathering. We also have chemical weathering. Water from rain, as I said before, can dissolve certain elements of the rocks. And as it dissolves those elements, the rest of the rock begins to crumble apart. So here's another experiment. Put a rock in a glass of water and let it sit for a while, for a month or so. Watch it as that happens. Do you see any changes? It's your experiment. Let me know. The actual process of water running over rocks, of course, can also break down rocks through chemical dissolution, as well as by carrying sediments like sandpaper over the tops of rocks and breaking them down. And if you've ever felt rocks in a stream somewhere in your exploration of various places where there's rivers, those rocks are smooth because of the weathering processes that have broken down the rough edges of those rocks. The final type of weathering is biological weathering. And geologists don't often recognize biological weathering as distinct from physical and mechanical weathering, but I think there's an important distinction to be made. Biological weathering includes things like trees breaking apart sidewalks or lichens breaking down rocks. If you've ever been out into the desert and seen those colored patches of organisms on the sides of rocks, those are lichens. They secrete acids that break down rocks and create soil, so it's an important process. Here's an experiment to try. Walk around your neighborhood. See any broken sidewalks from trees? See any lichens? If you had, you've seen examples of biological weathering. Write me about it. Here's some lichens that occurred on some rocks uh, out in the desert. This is from Joshua Tree National Park. And you see these brightly colored organisms, which are a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an algae called lichens. L-I-C-H-E-N-S, for those of you taking notes. 